A number of times in previous sections, I've mentioned the two issues around using hippocampal receptive fields to drive indirect activation. One is the need to use separate neuron populations to drive expansions and to drive indirect activations. And the second is the need to indirectly activate not just the columns that expanded during a past experience, but preferably all the columns that were active. And now we'll shift to a deeper level of description to come to grips with these issues. One factor that will be important at this more detailed level is the existence of a number of separate receptive fields on a neuron, as we discussed for semantic memory. The inputs to basal dendrites generally define the receptive field detected within current sensory circumstances, while the apical inputs define a receptive field indicating the circumstances in which indirect activation should occur. Although, as we'll see, within the hippocampal system, the situation is a bit more complex. Now, exactly how receptive field expansion and indirect activation are implemented at the neuron level without confusion isn't precisely known. But what we can do is outline a way in which they could be implemented using only known neuron mechanisms and remaining consistent with known anatomy and physiology. And this illustrates a possible connectivity between a cortical column and a parahippocampal column. A key point is that three different types of pyramidal neurons are observed in the deep layers of the parahippocampal columns. The P1 population is regular spiking. It fires like deep neurons in most cortical columns, producing spikes at relatively irregular intervals. But the P2 and P3 populations are fairly unique to the parahippocampal cortex. Population P2 are burst firing. They produce short bursts of action potentials. And the P3 population are late firing. They produce action potentials between 1 and 10 seconds after the inputs that drive them. One interpretation of the role of these different populations is that the burst firing population drives receptive field expansion. The P1 population blocks receptive field expansion if there's already lots of receptive field detections anyway. And the P3 population drives indirect activations on the basis of past activity during a period of receptive field expansion. And with this model, the late firing of the P3 population plays a role in experiencing sequences of past events. And to see how late firing could be relevant here, let's suppose that this is some set of deep or layer 5, 6 cortical column neurons. And the subset color green are the active neurons during some episode of receptive field expansion at one point in a novel experience. Then suppose that a few seconds later in the novel experience, a different subset is active during a slightly later episode of receptive field expansion. If this is a late firing P3 population neuron, suppose that neuron has weak inputs from deep column neurons uh, that uh, were active during the first receptive field expansion episode, and the weights of those inputs increase in response to the active inputs during the episode. And the increases become long-term if the P3 neuron fires a few seconds later. By the time it fires, a later different group of deep cortical neurons are active. So the P3 neuron could acquire increased synaptic strengths onto the neurons that were active later. So what this achieves is that if much later there's a recall of the event, the group of cortical neurons active during one episode of receptive field expansion has the ability to indirectly activate the group active during a slightly later episode. In other words, the temporal sequence of a past experience has been recorded and the sequence of events in that experience can be reactivated in the correct order. So let's have a look at all this connectivity in a bit more detail. There's two columns illustrated, a parietal column and a parahippocampal cortex column 
that includes the parietal cort cortical column in its receptive field and therefore contributes to managing receptive field changes of that parietal column. The parietal cortical column has pyramidal neurons and to simplify we will just think about the upper layers 2 and 3 as one layer and the deep layers 5 and 6 as a second layer. And remember that the upper layers 2 and 3 provide inputs to the deep layers and the deep layers 5 and 6 provide outputs from the column and can therefore be regarded as indicating detections of the column receptive field. So as we've discussed before, if there are no deep layer receptive field detections but activity in the upper layers, this indicates that only a relatively small column receptive field expansion will be needed to get detections. There are also interneurons and I'll discuss a number of populations of interneurons with different connectivities that are relevant to the management of receptive field expansion and of indirect activation processes. I will be leaving out the interneurons involved in placing frequency modulations on pyramidal neuron outputs. The one population illustrated here targets deep pyramidals in the regular cortical column. It gets inputs from those deep pyramidals. So one such interneuron gets inputs from many deep pyramidals in the column and targets many deep pyramidals. And I've conceptually illustrated this using just one neuron. But because many pyramidals target an interneuron and an interneuron targets many pyramidals, the, this connectivity limits the number of deep pyramidals that can be active at the same time. If lots of pyramidals were active, interneuron activity would increase and deactivate some of the pyramidals. The outputs from the upper layer pyramidals target the basal dendrites of the deep pyramidals, as I've indicated by those two arrows. So, in the way we've discussed before, the receptive fields of the deep pyramidals are combinations of upper layer receptive fields. And of course, the deep layer receptive field detections are the column output receptive field detections. The basal dendrite inputs are on two synapses which can have different weights, including zero weight silent synapses in some cases. So let's move on to the parahippocampal column. The general structure of a parahippocampal column is the same, with upper and deep layers of pyramidals. But in this case, there are three populations of deep pyramidals. And these differ in the sources of their inputs and in the targets for their outputs, as well as in the dynamics of firing. But let's first consider the inputs to the upper layer pyramidals that define their receptive fields. And again, these inputs can have different synaptic weights. The inputs come from the upper layers of a group of different cortical columns. So these upper layer parahippocampal neurons have receptive fields that can indicate the degree of activity in the upper layers of a group of cortical columns. The outputs from these middle layer neurons go to the entorhinal cortex, as I've indicated by the arrow, and from there on to the hippocampus proper. Now let's think about the pyramidal population P1. The inputs to these P1 neurons are outputs from the upper layer. So they have receptive fields that are combinations of the upper layer receptive fields. So these P1 neurons are somewhat analogous with the deep neurons in a regular cortical column. The P2 population neurons get inputs from the entorhinal cortex. These inputs indicate that the group of cortical columns from which this parahippocampal column gets its inputs has been selected as an appropriate location for receptive field expansions. And as we'll see shortly, it's the outputs of these P2 neurons, burst firing neurons, that drive the receptive field expansions. There's also a population of interneurons. And this population of interneurons get their inputs from the pyramidal population P1. 
the interneurons target the somas of the population P2 neurons. So a strong P1 activity will suppress P2 activity. And if you like, if the column is detecting its receptive field already, as indicated by P1 activity, that will suppress P2 activity and prevent receptive field expansions. The P3 population manages indirect activations. P3 neurons get the same inputs from the entorhinal cortex as P2, arriving on the apical dendrites. But on the basal dendrites of these P3 neurons, there are synapses from the deep pyramidals in the associated group of cortical columns. The P3 neurons target the apical dendrites of the same deep cortical pyramidals. And as we'll describe in a moment, this connectivity manages indirect activations on the basis of uh, past receptive field expansions. Now, going back to the P2 population, P2 outputs target the basal dendrites of the deep layer in the cortical columns. And these are the inputs that drive receptive field expansions in those deep cortical neurons. Outputs from the P2 population also drive receptive field expansions of the P1 population uh, in the perirhinal, in the parahippocampal column. There are also two more populations of interneurons that are relevant in this context, one in the cortical column, one in the parahippocampal column. In the cortical column, the interneuron population gets inputs from the upper layer pyramidals and targets the points where the integrated results of apical inputs proceed towards the soma. So very strong upper layer activity blocks the ability of those apical inputs to influence deep neuron firing. However, the ability of backpropagating action potentials from the soma to reach into the apical dendrite isn't affected. So despite this inhibition, Neuron firing will increase the weights of any recently active apical inputs. The interneuron population in the parahippocampal column gets its inputs from population P2 and targets the analogous points on the basal dendrites of population P3. So again, if there's strong P2 activity, the ability of the P3 basal dendrites to influence neuron firing is blocked. Although, again, back-propagating action potentials can still reach into the basal dendrite. So, this is the pattern of connectivity. And having gone through each element in the connectivity, let's now go step-by-step step through how this connectivity can manage the two functions, receptive field expansion and indirect activation, effectively and without confusion. If there's strong activity in layers 2-3 of a cortical column, that indicates the column could be an appropriate candidate for receptive field expansion. This activity is communicated to a number of different parahippocampal columns because one cortical column at different times will have tended to expand at the same time as a different groups of cortical columns. Inputs from a number of upper layer neurons in a number of columns therefore target the upper layer pyramidals in any one parahippocampal column. So if there's strong upper layer activity in a significant proportion of the cortical columns in the group that provides inputs to this parahippocampal column, upper layer neurons in the perihinal column will fire. This firing is communicated to the entorhinal cortex and then on to the hippocampus proper. The entorhinal cortex and hippocampus proper determine which parahippocampal columns correspond with groups of cortical columns that could be appropriate for receptive field expansion. The parahippocampal column gets inputs back from the entorhinal cortex, carrying the conclusions uh, about which columns are appropriate for expansion. And if the parahippocampal column is part of a number of entorhinal columns that have been selected for receptive field expansions, it'll get strong inputs back from multiple sources in the entorhinal cortex. And these inputs target the P2 and the P3 population neurons.
If the inputs are strong enough, they'll cause these neurons to fire. The P2 neurons drive receptive field expansions. But there's an inhibitory factor acting on these neurons. If the upper layer activity in the parahippocampal column is sufficiently strong to result in receptive field detections in the P1 population, the implication is that the parahippocampal column is already detecting its receptive field and the internal activity in its group of cortical columns is probably large enough that they're also already detecting their receptive fields. So no receptive field expansions are appropriate. So P1 activity acts via interneurons to inhibit the P2 neurons and suppress their activity. So receptive field expansions are blocked. But let's suppose this isn't the situation and there is some P2 activity. The P2 activity encourages receptive field expansion in the deep pyramidals of its group of cortical columns. And if a column gets such inputs from a number of parahippocampal columns, receptive field expansion will occur. The P2 activity also targets the P1 population. It will drive receptive field expansions in that population as well, and the additional P1 activity will terminate the P2 activity, because as the P1 activity builds up, it will increase the interneuron activity and cut off further receptive field expansion. So the degree of receptive field expansion is managed. Furthermore, the expansions of the P1 receptive field will prevent further expansions in similar or identical circumstances in the future. In other words, there'll be no expansions in the future if the situation is familiar. But going back to the target cortical column, receptive field expansion in the illustrated deep pyramidal will cause that pyramidal to fire. In actual fact, there's a population of these deep pyramidal neurons, and if lots were already firing without receptive field expansion, then the inhibitive feedback through the interneurons would prevent additional neurons from firing, which would block the expansion of their receptive fields. So receptive field expansions will only occur in a column if the column isn't already detecting its receptive field. Now, in any situation in which receptive field expansion is being encouraged by P2 outputs, there will always be some deep cortical column neurons producing outputs, whether or not there's actual receptive field expansion in the target column. The outputs of any active deep neurons, including any activated as a result of the expansion, will be communicated back to the P3 population, which is already active because of the enterhinal inputs. Now, these inputs are to the basal dendrites of the P3 neurons, and when there's receptive field expansion going on, the P2 activity activates into neurons that block any contribution of the basal dendrites to P3 firing. But if the P3 neuron is already firing as a result of the enterhinal input, there'll be a backpropagating action potentials in the P3 neurons, and these backpropagating action potentials aren't affected by the inhibition and can penetrate into the basal dendrites. So the weights of any basal synapses active as a result of cortical column inputs will be increased. Hence, information about the combination of active deep pyramidals across the group of cortical columns will be recorded by the P3 population. Whenever enterhinal inputs strong enough to drive receptive field expansions are present. And this combination reflects the group of columns active when the receptive field expansion was occurring, not just the ones expanding. Over in the target cortical columns, if receptive field expansion is being encouraged, there will be significant upper layer activity. This upper layer activity will result in firing of the population of interneurons. And these interneurons target the junctions of the deep layer apical dendrites with their somas. So although some P3 neurons are firing, their activity won't influence deep pyramidal firing in the target cortical columns.
However, again, there'll be back-propagating action potentials in any deep cortical neurons that are firing that can penetrate the apical dendrite and increase the weights of the synapses from any active P3 neurons. So again, information will be recorded about the identities of the active P3 neurons in any parahippocampal columns that are providing inputs to the column. So overall, whenever there's an episode of receptive field expansion in the group of cortical columns that forms the receptive field of a parahippocampal column, information is recorded on the basal dendrites of the P3 population that can identify the group of cortical column deep neurons active during the receptive field expansion episode. And that includes both neurons that were active as a result of receptive field expansion and neurons active without expansion. The apical dendrites on the deep column neurons record information about the group of P3 neurons that were active during the same episode. So on a later occasion, if some deep layer cortical column pyramidals are active and their activity is prolonged so that the upper layer activity and any associated parahippocampal activity has ended, if in addition the behavior of releasing outputs from these deep neurons to the parahippocampal cortex is accepted, then depending on the exact group of deep neurons that's active, a specific group of P3 neurons will be activated, and their outputs go back to a specific group of cortical columns. So there'll be a tendency for this activation loop to converge on a past activation pattern when the cortical columns were all active at the same time and receptive field expansion was occurring in some members of the group. In other words, a seed activation of deep cortical column neurons results in creation of a pattern of activation during some past experience in which there was receptive field expansion. A couple more important points. Firstly, soon after an episode of receptive field expansion, the probability that an indirect activation to reconstruct the memory will be behaviorally valuable is relatively high, but perhaps a bit less as time passes. So the initial synaptic weights from P3 neurons onto deep column neurons and vice versa will start high and decline somewhat with time. But each time a memory is recalled, it makes it more likely that future recalls will be behaviorally valuable, so the weight should increase. And in support of this, each time a memory is recalled, there will be back-propagating action potentials that can increase synaptic weights, so the ability to recall the memory increases. However, any irrelevant deep cortical column neurons that, ha that happen to be active, perhaps as a result of sensory inputs or semantic-type indirect activations, then these irrelevant neurons could become incorporated in the P3 receptive fields leading to their activation in future memory recalls and therefore corrupting the memory to a degree. Now, let me go on to another extremely big important point. Many of the P3 neurons are what was called what are called late spiking neurons. And remember, when this type of neuron gets input strong enough to cause it to fire, its actual firing is delayed until some time period after inputs were received and the time period varies, and it can be a number of seconds. So as we discussed earlier, this makes it possible to reconstruct the temporal sequence of events in a memory.